Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're going to talk about how we develop blue ocean strategies. Now we have another video that compares a blue ocean strategy versus red ocean strategy, because what you want to think about is a blue ocean to think about it. When you go to the beach and you see that blue ocean out there, you're like, oh, it's so calm, it's so beautiful, I want to enjoy it. But when it's a red ocean, do you want to get in the red ocean? No, there's blood in the water and all the animals are fighting, the fish are fighting, the sharks, it's just a massacre, it's horrible! Competition all kinds of competition in that red, red ocean. The blue, calm ocean, that's where I wanna be. And when we start thinking about developing a blue ocean strategy, is we're trying to find that new untouched market. We're gonna hopefully create a new market that doesn't even exist anymore. If you think back 20 years ago, there was no low cost airlines. I mean, they didn't exist. Now you've got them all over the place. I mean, yes, there was like a Southwest and some stuff, but the Ryanair is the Easy Jets, the Allegiance, the Spirits, all these things, they weren't out there. It was all these major carriers, the Deltas, the TWAs, the Uniteds, the uh, you know, Americans, all this kind of stuff, they had those. And the thing is, is there was no market out there for low cost travel that didn't even exist. If you wanted to travel, it was super expensive. But then companies like Ryanair and EasyJet, they, they kind of created this blue ocean. They said, wait, what if we do something totally different? What if we make travel accessible to everyone, not just the rich? <laughs> Mind explosion, like what? A whole new kind of demographic, a whole new thing out there? Yeah, what if we did that? Because what happens in a blue ocean strategy is you focus on making your competition irrelevant. It doesn't matter that Delta has way better service than Allegiant. It doesn't matter that British Airway has got really fancy treats. It doesn't matter because EasyJet is making you pay for the food and, and, and Southwest is like, yeah, whatever, you'll be fine. I mean, Southwest is nice, don't get me wrong. But you start to see it's like, look, no one cares that you get food when the flight is five bucks, right? You're like, I mean, think about it. If a flight is a thousand dollars, you're going to be expecting, you know, a nice meal, some entertainment, stuff like that. But for that same thousand dollar flight, you get it for 150 bucks. You're like, you know, I just hope we land safely. Like you can treat me like crap. I don't care because it's it's 150 bucks versus a thousand. And so that's what you start to see is when with Blue Ocean, we're going for this whole untapped market and the airlines, the cheap airlines, they really went for that whole untapped market. There are people that just weren't flying. I mean, I've been traveling to Europe for decades now, okay? Eyes old, okay? And I, I you see the total change in demographic. So many more people can travel. When I used to live in Lisbon, I did my PhD there and it was cheaper for me to fly to Rome, like across the continent, than it was for me to take the train to the north part of Portugal. I'm like, whoa, so if I want Italian food, 35 euros, so like 40 bucks, to fly to, to Italy to have Italian food, or, wait a minute, why would I hear, you know, you start seeing these things. And that's what they did. They really saw this whole new market and, and they developed really a new product, a new scheme out there for these low cost carriers. And, and the thing is, is they did really thrive for a long time and they've drove some of the a long time carriers out of business and they've now that, that low cost thing has become a little bit of a red, of a red ocean. Because one thing you have to realize is these blue oceans don't stay blue forever. People see that, wait, there's money being made. You know, Ryanair did well, then EasyJet came in and, and Vueling and, and Wiz and uh, you know, all the, you know, uh, Wow Air and all the, and Zim and Zippy and all these things. And not all of them survived because the competition came. But at first, it was a whole new market. And that's what's great about this blue ocean. When you start working with it, you try to come up with a new innovation, a new market, because it really does encourage innovation because it helps you think about how you deal with customer needs in a completely different way. Okay. And so what you want to do is, you know, you, we had that video on benchmarking, you throw out the benchmarks. I'm not comparing myself like EasyJet or, 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 or Southwest or Allegiant. We're not comparing ourselves to Emirates. We're a whole different thing. You know, it's like, I don't compare myself to an accounting professor. That's a whole different area. I'm a social media guy. I'm a marketing guy. We're in a different world here, right? And so you start thinking that way, it gets you working a different way. It gets you creating new kinds of topics, new kinds of products, new kinds of services in this new blue ocean that's free to try out. And so what you might do is you might ask yourself a few questions. You know, you might think about it in terms of, you know, which factors does the industry kind of take for granted, right? And that we could maybe eliminate. Like back in the day, you used to get free checked luggage. Crazy, right? You used to get free food on the planes. I, I know, I know, this is, this is insanity, right? What? Free stuff? You're kidding me. No, they used to have that. And so what these cheap airlines saw is like, wait, 
you know, people expect to get that free, but would they pay for it otherwise? Could we encourage them not to do it? Because now, hey, if, if we charge for the luggage and people don't, people don't don't bring it, right? It's like, oh, that makes it cheaper on our air, gas mileage and stuff like that. We can board the planes faster. And so you saw where they really did eliminate the free check bags. So free, I mean, there's been places where if they printed out your ticket, your boarding pass, at the airport you had to pay for it so hey save us the money by making the people at home print it out so if you want to do it you you put on the printing the printing cost right you're like what the heck i mean how many times have you bought an airline ticket and they're like oh yeah oh but you want to pay with a credit card oh that's an extra eight dollars or eight euros oh a debit card that's five euros you're like wait a minute then how am i supposed to pay without that extra charge they're finding these things that we can eliminate free purchasing you see that okay so and i remember when the airlines the cheap airlines started charging for bags and some of the the major carriers were like oh we won't do that you're like yeah right when they saw the kind of money they made from just charging for the baggage <laughs> Yeah, sure. And so they started doing that because that was that's a whole other new thing. That whole blue ocean of, well, we could be making money on selling luggage space that used to be free or, or upgraded food options. Huh, I never thought about that. That's looking at things that might be able to be eliminated that we could charge for. But sometimes you're looking at, hey, are there things that we could reduce, right? Like that, that could lower our costs. Well, that's where you saw food on flights. Look, instead of maybe not having, well, they, they went from free to the pain, but also if you look at the options, we didn't have to have as nice of foods or as fancy stuff. If you look at, back at some of those videos, it says, oh, the fancy day of flight in the 50s and 60s, where it's like, you know, they're having like lobster tails and steak. You know, don't worry, they still have that in first class. I had to pee in first class once, um, like and walk through it and I saw it. I was like, oh, snap, they got some good stuff there, right? And, but the rest of us in, in stowage, you know, we don't really get, we like, here's some peanuts, you know, like if you're lucky. And so what they saw is like, look, we could reduce the food. We don't have to give them as many things. I mean, cheap airlines. I mean, how many of you have been on a, a cheap airline? I'm not saying all of them, but some of them I've been on that it's like the plane is dirty. Like, wait, we can cut back on the cleaning to save money. I mean, now post COVID and all those things are cleaning up a little bit more, but I'm like, why weren't you cleaning in the first place? Ah, because we can use that to lower prices. Cause people are like, you know what? It's a dirty plane, but I paid five bucks for the flight to Florida. Okay, so, so you see those things like that. And then you could also look at it in terms of, hey, how is there, are there things that we could really raise like above and a different level, like be way better at in an industry that's not already there. And so what the low cost airlines did is they did really a lot better with low prices, right? For the flights that inspire people to travel. I mean, that's the thing is, I mean, I wish we had the low cost airlines when I was in college because I would have traveled so much more when I did my master's and, and PhD in Europe back in the day. I mean, they, they were coming near the end, but I'm like, man, it was so much cheaper now to go see the world, you know? It's like fantastic. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I started flying to Europe in the 90s. Okay, I'm old. I'm old. Okay, I'm old. And I actually paid I still, in actual dollar amounts my ticket to go to Germany in 19, was it 1996? Okay, was $1,200. Okay, my ticket to go to Ireland in, in, that I have for this fall was 400 You know, and, and I know that it's low season, high season, whatever, but I mean, those tickets are actually still by grand. So I'm like, wait. 20 years later and 20 some plus years later and the price is actually lower what what's going on well because there's been so much competition because they saw that look though these cheap airlines you know went for this whole other market they had influences on the other market the, the long haul carrier stuff right and so we start seeing things crossing over and that's where you see that the blue ocean eventually does become red because companies do start fighting over those seats. That's why you see American United, you know, Delta, they have their like super economy fares, you know, like, oh, you don't get any luggage, you pay the lowest price, but you can save money. So if you want that $100 flight, you can get that from Delta, but you're not going to get any of those extras. So they're looking at what can be eliminated, right? Oh, you get to board early. You get to pick your seat. You don't get stuck in the middle. So, so things like that. And so overall, on some kind of these principles of the blue ocean, and this, this kind of really leads into our other video on this. So if I'm repeating myself and you watch that one, I apologize. But really, you got to think about it in terms of reconstructing the market boundaries. It's no longer flying is for the rich. It's flying for everybody. Why can't it be for everybody? Let's change that. Okay, then another thing you have to look at is you, you kind of look at things in the big picture. It's not just this one little stuff. It's like, no, no, we're not just like making just cheap flights from Chicago to Florida. Oh, no, no. The big picture is I see Americans flying all over America for next to nothing. 
flights the cost of Greyhound bus tickets for Amtrak tickets. Wow, I mean, think about it. that's how Europe completely changed their tourism. It's like, look, this isn't about, you know, Brits going down to Mallorca or Germans going to Mallorca to party. This is about everybody in Europe going anywhere they want to go on the weekend. Like that's a whole other thing. And so when you start thinking big picture, it's a lot easier to think of that blue ocean because it's a big ocean out there. So let's think big picture. And the thing is, that's why it's important when you're developing a blue ocean strategy, you really reach beyond the existing demand. I mean, because if EasyJet and Ryanair and Southwest just went for the same routes and, and passengers that Delta and British Airways had, they wouldn't have won. They had to go for somebody different. You have to go for a different demand. Go for just the leisure travelers or the, the low cost travelers and stuff like that and not worry about the business travelers. You don't see Ryanair first class, right? You don't see Southwest first class too often, right? So you have to think about those things, right? And the thing is, is when we're putting this together, when you're putting your blue ocean together, you really have to make it, make sure everything kind of fits together. Cause you'll see at first, I remember, cause I saw how the, the cheap low cost airlines spread throughout Europe and the US. Yeah, they started with, okay, we all have flights to London. And then it's like, okay, we see that there's a lot of people that want to go from to Lisbon. So then they made Lisbon a base a few years later and they started spreading out that way. It's like, look, we have to think longer term here, that bigger picture. Let's think of the sequence. I'm not going to start my airline out of the Ozarks. I'm going to start it out of Florida and then expand from there because like Florida's a big destination. And then once we got Florida down, where's another thing? Oh, we got Texas. We got people there. We got Mexico. We've got Jamaica. We've got Cancun, right? And so you're starting to see all these things we have a sequence, we have a thing that really plans out because you want to think about those sequences, what's going to be the next thing? Because if you go for the blue ocean, just one little pocket, know that that competition is going to come sooner. So you got to think it's what's the next step for our blue ocean. It's kind of like when you go to the, you go to the beach, oh, when there's nobody on the beach, it's nice. But when people start showing up, you might scoot down to another place on the beach because it's a little bit nicer, or a little bit less crowded. You might be doing that, okay? Now, another thing that's really important with blue ocean strategies is I've tried to institute these in a few places I've worked before and they're tough because you have a lot of organizational hurdles. You know, like one of my bosses I've had, I, I love the guy to death and he had the fantastic, I'm totally for this, to make our college the, one of the top five undergraduate business schools, right? And you're like, yes, this is awesome. I mean, I'm an undergraduate educator. I love undergrad education. I want to help out as many students as I can. Let's be the best we can be. But the thing is, sometimes you have organizational hurdles because think about it. If you work at a university, people don't usually judge your undergrad. They judge your MBA. Like, what does your MBA rank? That's what shows it's a good business school. Well, the thing is, if you're telling people that, oh, we need to look at undergraduate. Wait, I spent my entire career trying to build this MBA. And now you're telling me I have to look at undergrads? Don't you think there's going to be some friction? There's going to be some hurdles you have to get over. So we have to get everybody on board and understand that, look, by building this top five undergraduate program, most of the people coming back for that MBA are from an undergrad program. They're going to come back and be even better, which will then in 10 years time really explode that MBA program, and make it even better. Oh, right. And so you have to think about things like that. All right. And the thing is, is when you're doing all this, you really got to really build in an exit an execution strategy. What's step one? What's step two? What's step three? You know, what are the things we need to make sure we're doing? Like, are there certain competencies we have to have? You know, it's it's kind of like, you know, one of the reasons why the, the cheaper airlines did got to do so well is they weren't flying to Heathrow. They were going to, in London, they're going to Stansted, a cheaper airport. They weren't going to the main airport. They're going to want right outside. Yeah, it's a little bit farther to go, but they were happy to have people come in. And they saw that, look, this is something we need to do. This is why we can actually lower our costs, okay? And so we think about those things. And, and with this whole blue ocean, I think what's really important is whatever your goal is in your business, make sure you're tying the awards and the compensation to your employees to this new blue ocean strategy. Because if the, everybody's getting paid based on that old red ocean strategy stuff, they're gonna stay there because that's what's paying their bills. You gotta change the way we pay our people as well, okay, or reward them. So I hope this helps you know a bit more about Blue Ocean strategy and how to create it. Do check out our video that really compares Red Ocean and Blue Ocean to give a lot more of a like feel for all sides of it. And I wish you all the best. Bye.